Hi my friends, today we are going to make wooden tea tracks for different jigs by three different methods. Hi my friends, how are you? I hope everybody is fine. My name is Daniel Villarino. Welcome to my YouTube channel. A few videos back I did these star knobs that you can see here that I mentioned we were going to use for some jigs in the workshop and they work really well in combination with these T-bolts which have a flat head which is longer than wider and slightly rounded on both sides and they run along something that is called a T-track and here I have one made out of wood and you can see how that gets in there and slides all along but when you want to tighten the knob the screw or the bolt is not going to turn around because it's going to make top against the sides of the T. So these T tracks are used in multiple accessories in the workshop in the table saw, in the band saw, in the drill press, even on the lathe and one thing that happens is that along those T-tracks you can slide a stop which it will provide you the opportunity to make holes always at the same distance for different pieces of wood or to make a cut always of the same length on the table saw or you can also attach to them clamps that will fix the work that you are doing and then have a more secure hold on it without using your fingers or you can use those uh, feather boards to hold down a piece of wood that you are cutting on the table saw and then make a safer cut. So there are multiple uses for these T-tracks. Now these T-tracks you can find in aluminum and here is a picture of one of those and the aluminum ones are really great they are normally extruded aluminum and they will last long and they are metal so they probably will be there for all the life of the jig or you can make them in wood the issue whether to use one or the other is how much you want to spend the wooden ones will last less but they are much cheaper and if you have the way to do it it's very easy to, to prepare them as you will see. So this wooden one for example is made out of granadillo and granadillo is a very heavy and dense wood, it's a hard wood and it's perfect for this type of job. Now how you make this yourself? Uh, there are a couple of different methods. One of them is using a router bit like this one here I don't know if you can see them very well against the contrast of my t-shirt or maybe here I don't know but the thing is that it has a sharp edge over here and it also has a sharp edge on the neck right there so that router bit will work really well to make the whole track all along and actually this one I made it with just one pass of this router bit. Now, if you want to save a little bit the sharp edge of, the, of this router bit, one thing that you can do is to hog off the middle of the T-track using just a straight bit like this one or similar to this one for the middle and then use the T-track bit to make the wings on the top. Okay? Now, you can use also uh, bolts uh, on these T-tracks, just regular bolts like this one and here I have one I made in pine and by the way pine is not the best suited wood for this type of job because it's a very soft wood and eventually it's going to wear off but uh, this is just a test and you can see that you can slide the bolt there maybe it won't slide as easily as the T-bolts but still it's going to work and one thing is that because it's an hexagonal head when you try to turn it around the bolt won't budge because it will hit the sides of the T-track so 
The second way to do these T-tracks instead of using the router bits is just using the table saw. And here you have a couple of options. One of them is using dados, the other one is just using a regular blade. The only difference is that with a regular blade it's going to take you a little more work. But for example, if you have a dado, you got a piece of wood and then with the dado you make the wide part of the T-track and the dado will cut also the, the wings. So it will be like a C rather than, than the T-shape that you have here is going to be just a rectangular uh, shape so that means that you don't have the T-track yet but then you attach, you glue to the bottom part a thin board and then you pass that thin board on the blade again and you make the thinner space and then you get the T-shape so making these T-tracks in wood through these different methods is today's project. I hope you enjoy it. Let's get to work. Some time ago I got a nice bunch of Granadillo blanks. Granadillo is a hard, dense wood and will work well for these wooden tea tracks. I want blanks that do not have knots or defects and where the grain runs pretty straight. This one, in particular, has a couple of knots, so no, I will set it to the side. Let's try this one. The grain runs pretty even and there are no apparent knots or defects. This is a good candidate. This one also has a knot here, so I will leave it to the side as well. Ah, this one also looks well. With these two I have enough to make a few T-tracks. I'm going to take this little hard maple board that will also be useful. As always, ear, face and lung protection. Sometimes these blanks have a certain curvature and the surface is rough cut. I am going to give them some passes through the table saw to square them and clean them. A good safety practice is to raise the table saw blade just above the height needed to complete the cut. That way we are not exposing too much of the blade on top of the blank. I approach the fence just until the blank is fitting perfectly between the fence and the blade. Then I remove the blank and I give the fence a few taps to move it just barely towards the blade. That way we minimize the amount of wood that we are removing in each pass. The use of push blocks is another good safety practice. That way we always keep our hands conveniently away from the rotating blade. The push block may be as simple as a long thin board. We try to keep the blank well supported against the table and against the fence. I inspect the cut and then I place the freshly cut face against the table to make another cut. That implies a 90 degree rotation of the blank and ensures that we will keep a blank section more or less square. You can see that the piece is a little away from the fence in the middle and touching in the ends. This is preferred to the other way around because it will keep the cut in the opposing face a little straighter. After these two initial cuts we need to bring the fence a little closer for the two remaining faces. 
If you have a jointer and a planer, the process of dimensioning wood will be faster and more efficient, but eventually doing cuts this way we will keep straightening the sides and obtaining a pretty even blank of a square section. I am going to repeat the process, but this time I will number the sides and paint them to have a good reference of what I am cutting. The secret for this method to work consists in three points. First, always select to place against the fence the straighter face you have. The second is that if you have to opt between placing against the fence a face with a cap or a face with a bow, place first the one with the cap, because to separate points that will be in contact with the fence most of the time, will always form a straight line. The third is that this works only for relatively short pieces. If the board is too long, it will be difficult to keep always against the fence the same two points. Placing a sturdy straight edge against the sides, we verify that they are indeed straight. And using a square, we check that the angles are at 90 degrees. With the caliper, I measure the thickness and mark the square section. I move the fence and I get the square section close to one of the saw teeth to try to get the saw to cut along through the middle. Because of the grain, I realized that it would be better to cut placing the blank on the other face, but since the section is a square, all the previous measurements are still valid. I always try to keep my fingers at a distance of at least 4 inches from the blade. These two boards are ready for the next stage. I will repeat the process with the other granadillo blank to have a total of 4 boards. This piece had an even more pronounced valley on one side and a bow on the opposing face. But using the same method, I got four straight sides, a square section, and four 90 degree angles on all corners. I straighten one of the sides of the maple board. I use one of the granadillo boards as a reference to move the fence so that I can cut the maple the same width. As you can see, I lowered the saw blade so it will be protruding on top of the maple board just a little. I will cut two boards of the same width, and the third, which is thinner, I will use it for a T-track that will host a bolt with hexagonal head. I will cut one of the four granadillo boards all along by the middle, so I will get two that will have the same width, but they are going to be thinner. These boards will serve the purpose of closures for the grooves I will do in the maple boards. At the end of one of the maple boards, I mark the center and using it as a reference, I place the head of one of the T bolts and mark its sides. I 
I use a bronze precision setup bar to check the depth of the cut that I want. I use that bar to check that I will have enough place for the bolt's head. And using the same bar, I regulate the height of the saw's blade. I place the fence so that the saw's tool will cut up to the border of the mark line, and even a hair more so the T bolt will slide comfortably. After the first cut, I rotate the blank to put against the fence the opposing face and make a cut that will be symmetrical to the first one. This way, I will have delimited the width of the dado. Since the other maple piece has the same width, I will repeat the same cuts I just did. With the T-bolt, I verify that the head will slide well, but if I rotate it, it will press against the sides of the track. I move the fence towards the saw blade to make cuts towards the inside, but I try to move it less than the blade curve. This way of making rectangular dados on a board requires a little bit of work but anyone with a table saw can do it. If you have a dado blade, that will make the work easier because it will require less passes or just one. If you do not want to take so many measures, you can do as I will with this thinner board. You start more or less in the middle and keep doing cuts more and more towards the sides, checking from time to time the feet of the bolt, and we stop when the bolt head slides well. As you can see, the bolt head slides well, but does not twist inside the slot. This method of making a dado can sometimes leave small irregularities in the bottom of the dado that can be eliminated easily with a bench chisel. For this last track, I do not have a cover, so I will recycle this board that used to be the front of a drawer to make it. At the start, I thought it might have been cherry because of the color, but after making the cuts, it looks more like maple. I apply carpenter's glue on the edges and clean any spills that may have gotten towards the inside of the track. I cover the dado with a thin board and I will use multiple clamps to hold it tight and then I let it dry for 24 hours. I repeat the process for all the other tracks. I will replace the regular saw in my table saw by a combination of dado blades. To ease the access to the nut, I raise the blade as much as I can. 
The first thing we have to do is to remove the splitter, which is a security measure for regular blades, but it is going to bother when we are using the dado. I loosen the cam lever that presses against the splitter and I put from it to remove it. To work in a confined space like the one where the saw's blade is located with gloves can be difficult, but I have not removed this blade in some time, so at least to loosen it I will wear the gloves, even if I, after that I have to remove them for other operations. I locate the flat sides in the axis and place there one wrench and on the other side I fit the other wrench on the nut and I loosen it. Well, that worked better than I expected. Not having now the risk of a sudden movement, I can get the glove off to handle better the nut. Carefully, so that they will not fall, I can remove now the nut, the washer and finally the blade. Typically, a dado set has two saw blades that go one on each side of the stack of blades and separators. They produce a nice cut on the sides and part of the bottom of the dado. We also have chippers that have only two flat teeth and work on the parts of the bottom where the lateral blades do not reach. My set has three chippers. Because the cheaper blades and the lateral blades overlap because of the design of the stack, the set comes with three spacers of 1 16 of an inch and several shims, including one of 20 dows of an inch, one of 12 dows, one of 8 dows and five of 4 dows of an inch. The correct combination of blades, cheaper spacers and shims provides great flexibility in determining the width of the dado. I measured the bolt head from flat to flat and that gave me 12.4 mm, which is a hair short of half of an inch. The chart that comes with the set indicates that for a one half of an inch dado I need the two lateral blades plus two chippers and no spacers or shims. I place on the axis the first blade taking into consideration the arrow that indicates the rotation direction. I place now the chipper verifying that the cutting edge is in the same direction as the one in the lateral blade. I rotate everything about 90 degrees so when I place the second chipper its cutters will be separated from the cutters of the first chipper. I complete the sandwich with the second lateral blade, always taking into consideration the rotation direction of the saw. I secure everything in place using the washer and the nut. For safety reasons, all these operations were done with the power cord disconnected from the outlet. I tried to place the factory insert around the blade and the stack went through tight and did not sit well. I recalled I have an MDF zero clearance insert and decided to sacrifice it and transform it in a zero clearance insert for the dado. This means that I would have to make another zero clearance insert for my regular blade which will be a good topic for another video. I get the fence closer, so it will press over the insert, but leaving enough space between the fence and the slot, so the whole stack will go without damaging the fence. I connect the cord to the outlet, turn on the saw, and use the push stick to hold the insert from the other side, while I raise slowly the saw, so it will cut the MBF from below. I will raise the blade enough to have about three quarters of an inch above the tabletop and then I retract it and turn off the saw. I use a bronze setup block that I know is thicker than the bolt head to adjust the height of the dado blade. I try to center the best I can the thickness of the dado stack in the thickness of the wooden plank. 
but it does not have to be extremely precise because later I will pass the plank using the other side against the fence and that will give a little more clearance to the bolt head. The dado leaves a truly clean cut, both in the sides and the bottom of the cut. The bolt slides perfectly and without obstruction. Once we reach this point, we repeat the gluing process that we already have seen before. After all, I could not get back to the workshop for a couple of days, so the glue-ups had more than enough time to cure. So, let's remove the clamps. I have a small plane that will be useful to get rid of the dry glue and smooth any displacement due to the glue-ups. I measured the diameter of the threaded part of the bolt and gave me a hair below 5 sixteenths of an inch. If I just use the two lateral blades of the dado with a thick spacer in the middle, that will be 5 sixteenths of an inch. So I am going to seize the opportunity that I have the dado blade at hand to remove the chippers and add the spacer. I try to center the dado the best I can so it will cut through the middle of the glued board. To keep symmetry, now I do another pass keeping the other side against the fence. That way, the hole will be perfectly centered in the board. I am going to remove the dado stack and replace it with a regular saw blade, so I can complete now a T-track for which I just use the ordinary equipment of a table saw, without the dado. To the board width, I subtract the bolt threaded part width and divide the result by half. I take that value in the caliper and mark the board that distance from each side. From there, I move the fence so that the cut of the blade will go through the internal side of the marks. Since the thin board is dark, I made the marks in the maple, but the cut will be through the granadillo. I make the first cut and from there I turn the wooden piece around so that the side that was opposed to the fence will now run against the fence. And then I make the second cut. Ok, we have seen how to do it with a regular saw and how to do it with a dado. The third method is using the router. First, we are going to use a straight router bit to eliminate material from the center of the groove we want to do. This helps to facilitate the work of the T-shaped router bit later. I place the granadillo board against the bit and I check the height. If I had to regulate the bit height, I simply release the lever that fixes the router body, see the yellow arrow, 
and I use the knob that is shown by the blue arrow to raise or lower the bit. I get the fence closer and I try to center the bit on the body of the board. For safety issues, the router was disconnected from the outlet, so now I connect it. After the first pass, I place the other side against the fence and make another pass to keep the cut symmetrical and centered. Besides, the rotor bit is of one quarter of an inch and the bolt threaded part is of little less than 5 sixteenths of an inch. So, the little out of center the bit was actually helped to widen it a little more the groove and allow the necessary clearance so the bolt can slide easily. At this point, ideally, I would have changed the rotor bit without moving the fence, but the fence is on top of the insert, so I had to move it. Therefore, I will make a pencil line as a reference. Having moved the fence, I can now remove the insert and access the rotor shaft and the nut that secures the rotor bit. Finally, I can install the T-slot rotor bit. I move the fence back to the pencil mark I made earlier. The rotor bit is too low, so I raise it. I try that the top part will match the line of the cut I already did. After this pass, I clean the shavings from the T-slot, I turn the board around and I give it another pass on the other side. Since these tracks are done without glue-ups, perhaps with the router is a faster and most effective way to do them. The truth is that they end up working really well. Ok my friends, as you have seen, we have made a bunch of T-tracks, you can see them here, by different methods. One of them was using just the, the table saw, like this one here, in which we had to glue two pieces in order to close the gap on the top. And that works with these T-bolts. It goes like that, and you can see it slides really nice, but when you tighten this, it just fixes whatever piece you want in the T-track. Then I did another one, also in the table saw and with two pieces that you can use with just regular hexagonal head bolts like this one and also slides really nice over there. We also use the router table and with that one we made one in just one piece because the router bit had the shape and that also works perfectly well. You can see it here, it slides really nice and we did some using the dado blades. So these T-tracks are going to be phenomenal for different accessories for the table saw, the drill press, etc. So 
we are going to see in the future how we use them. I hope you enjoyed this video. If that's the case, please mark the like button below, make comments. If you haven't subscribed yet to my channel, please do so. There appears the button to facilitate the subscription. And it will be until the next one. Cheers!